morning. <laughs> so wonderful always to see you. Isn't it amazing how fast the weeks go by and uh, we meet again? And so it's, it's always wonderful to be in your presence. This morning we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm glad to report that we're through the head covering. And uh, we can move on. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have difficult subjects, and I think the one today that we're looking at is yet a difficult subject as all of the Word of God is revealing, all of the Word of God is sobering, all of the Word of God is something that each one of us need, and uh, I trust you're here today uh, to, uh, to partake of what God has in store for each one of us that we might live our lives in a way that is pleasing to Him. So. With that, I would say that uh, uh, we're continuing in the, in the section here where uh, having to do with Christian worship, and we are now moving into the area we've, we've called here in the outline the sanctity of the Lord's Supper. The highlight, because of who is being honored at the table, is the Lord's Supper. And how we approach that for God's people that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb should be something that should be very soberingly reflective on us as we come before God and the preciousness of the reminder of what He did on our behalf on Calvary's cross. Who can comprehend? because in this table is where all of our hope, all of our joy, all of our thankfulness, it lies there because of what he did. With that, would you bow with me and let's ask the Lord to have mercy as we study his word together. Father, we humbly come before you recognizing your need to instruct us, your need to give us wisdom, wisdom that is found in your precious word. How we thank you, Father, that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, is able to pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is even a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's nothing like it. Father, help me to present your word and help us all, myself included, Father, to be soberly confronted with the reality of the word and the relationship that we need to have with you. Guide and direct every person that is here in their personal relationship with you. Have mercy, Father. Give us ears to hear. Use this time for your glory and help us to truly worship you from the heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that you are probably very much like me in the sense that, and it doesn't take much thought in that regard, to know that the world is in a mess. Now, some of us think that that world in a mess is due, at least in part, because we're coming to the close of life as we know it under the curse. And that's a joyful thing, but right now, things are certainly in a mess. And I guess I would make an advertisement here for the, uh, for the conference coming up, or the last times, and I uh, would encourage you to pick up one of the cards out there and sign up for that as we have uh, some teaching that will be very, I think, appropriate and very needful for that particular issue, something we all need to reflect upon and understand. But the world's a mess, isn't it? And everything seems to be, to one degree or another, uh, about fussing and feuding and factions and divisions and whatever you want to call it. And it began, of course, at the fall. It began when uh, Cain and Abel were born, and here's two brothers, and what did Abel, uh, uh, Cain do, but slew his own brother because he was 
disputing with him over jealousy, and it has been continuing ever since. And whether it be nations, as in Psalm 2, why the nations rage and the peoples devise a vain thing, or within the nations, or within the family, and within the community, and within the neighborhood, that's why the divorce rate is high. That's why the police department is very active. That's why there's riots in near St. Louis. That's why there's anger and bitterness and hatred, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's all about fussing and feuding. And you know, it even starts with little children. Even my sweet little grandchildren. They get, well, that's my toy. <laughs> wah, wah, you know. <laughs> mommy, 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 and so forth and so on. And it, and it continues. It continues. It magnifies itself and all these other things that are far greater than that. We can tolerate that with some kind words and um, some straightening out, whatever that means. But uh, uh, we can tolerate that. But what about the church? Here Paul is dealing with this messy church in Corinth. We've already seen, in fact, in the passage that we just dealt with when we came to verse 16, and really the issue there we think is about a head covering, and it was really about contention. Remember what's the last thing he said here, but if one is inclined to be contentious? And that was the issues. In fact, he will continue that dialogue in verse 17, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, for there was strife and contention in the church of the living God. I want you to start with me. Keep your finger, please, in 1 Corinthians and go back to Psalm 133. Every psalm has its place and position for certain reasons. And here's this Beautiful little picture. It's almost like a portrait is being painted. Look at what David says here. Behold, verse 1, Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then he paints this picture, the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, this anointing of the high priest Aaron coming down on the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Now, if you stand at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is a 9,000-plus foot uh, mountain, it, it is beautiful there. And that's the beginning place of the Jordan River that flows into the Sea of Galilee. And it is really so plush and, and gorgeous. And he's painting a picture here of the unity that is a blessing. And it is something that is not natural to sinful man who just naturally wants to fight and fuss and feud and put others down that they might be lifted up. It's all associated with pride and with rebellion towards God. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Here is a prophecy of yet future when Christ will return. And it, 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 in fact, in 11.1, then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from the roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the context will clearly show you that it is. He talks about judgment, and he talks about decisions, and of course, they're sovereign decisions, they're righteous decisions. But look down at verse 6. What will take place? The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The curse will be removed. The leopard will ride down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. Please, parents, don't think about that right now. But he's talking about a time of peace, peace that God will bring peace on the earth and unity on the earth. In fact, if we took the time to go back to Revelation chapter 22, when we're looking at the eternal kingdom of God 
and the new Jerusalem and the glory that is associated that with that. Here are the people of God around the throne room of Jesus Christ himself. And you know, there's not a whimper of jealousy, not a whimper of nitpicking or criticism, or there's not a whimper of being in each other's case or face, but there's all joy, there's all glory, there's all unity, and Christ is all in all. Well, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Praise God. <laughs> it wipes every tear from every eye. And some people wrestle with the fact, well, in the kingdom of heaven, how, how could, because we're so prone that way today under the curse that we're looking down the street and seeing what Mr. Jones has and saying, well, gee, he shouldn't have that. I'm a better guy than he is. I ought to have it. That's not the way it's going to be in the kingdom of God. Because love will be exactly what love should be. And thanksgiving and unity will be everything there that it should be. But in saying that, and I've said this before, with regard to the church, what should the church be? Is the church supposed to look like the world? Is the church supposed to be a place that we come in here and fuss and feud and fight and criticize and, and uh, get in each other's face, gossip and back talk and whatever? I've said before that the church should be a little bit of heaven on earth. A little bit of heaven on earth. And here in this particular portion where he's dealing with the Lord's table, which is a picture of of Christ on the cross and what he did that we might have relationship with him, this is about as close to the kingdom of God as we can possibly get on the earth, right? And what we're going to see, it's already been read in the context, is people that were meeting together selfishly, foolishly, around the Lord's table. And Paul has to deal with that, beginning again in verse 17. He says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. And why? Because you come together not for the better, but for the worst. And that, in other words, you ought to be going this direction, but instead you're going this direction. When he get down to verse 20, he says, not to eat the Lord's table. And he's explaining there, you're not really coming to worship the God of this table. You're not really, your heart is not in it. And all of these things, just like the head covering issue, was an issue of attitude of heart. And everything that relates to God is an issue of an attitude of heart with me and with you. Now it's issues forth in what we do in our actions, but it begins and it must be in the heart. And in verse 18 he adds, as a church, for in the first place when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And he says, as in part, I believe it. Please keep your finger here and look over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Because here he says, when you actually come together, you come for the worst, and we could get the impression, okay, then I guess we shouldn't come together, right? We can't get along or whatever. But Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that we have to get together. It is commanded by God that we get together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let me back up to verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for, the, for he who promised is faithful. Now, this church was being persecuted. It was dangerous for them to get together. There are places now, you know that. It's in the news that when people are getting together, 
and they are being persecuted in some cases. They're being put to death. Children are being beheaded. This is amazing. All in the name of Christ. These individuals were also being persecuted, but they were still commanded to get together. It was necessary, in other words. And he goes on to explain why it was necessary. He says, And let us consider how to stimulate, verse 24, one another to love and good deeds. Aside from divisions and factions is the whole idea of stimulating, and that is uh, the idea of coming together here is parakaleo, which as many of you know is coming alongside someone, and here is the idea of encouraging them in what? In godliness, in instruction of the Lord, in the promises of God, and he goes on to say, and without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, back up in verse 23, he says, but down in verse 25, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another. One of the things that ought to happen at the church is we ought to be encouraging one another. Encouraging one another in our walk with the Lord. Encouraging one another in knowing Christ Jesus. Encouraging one another to hang in there. What else is there? Is there hope somewhere else? Do you think this mess is going to straighten itself out aside from Jesus Christ? No. Encourage one another. God has promised. He says, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Now, that was nearly 2,000 years ago. <laughs> are we nearer today? Yes, and the signs are there that we're very near. What are we supposed to be doing, running for the hills? No. Encouraging one another all the more. Very important. Look at another place about the church and what they're to be about. Acts chapter 2 is probably one of the most revealing places because this is the beginning church before the time could set in and all the foolishness that, that sometimes enters the church in various ways uh, comes in. And here were these new believers. In Acts chapter 2, if you look at verse 42, it says, Let's back up to verse 41. Those who had been received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. What were they doing? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. They want, what they wanted to do was be continually together, continually in unity. They wanted to be in each other's presence. They saw it as a little bit of heaven on earth. They wanted to encourage one another. They wanted to edify one another. They wanted to be edified by each other, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, soaking it up like a sponge, and fellowshipping together. They loved each other, and they wanted to be in each other's presence. And so they were breaking bread together, which is a reference, I believe, to the eating centered around the Lord's table where Christ is all in all. And they were continually communing not only with one another, but vertically with the Lord God, continuing in prayer, communing with God. And nobody was pushing them into that. Nobody called a prayer meeting and they all said, well, you know, excuse me, I've got some place to go. <laughs> they wanted to talk with their Lord. And they wanted to talk with each other. Now, in what we've already read, can you see the vast difference between where the Corinthians have come to as a church and where this Acts beginning church is? But more than that is the examination of Corinth is given there by God that we might examine us, ourselves, that we might examine this church, which is very important. 
before God? What is his assessment of us? What is our personal attitude of worship? And what is our church attitude of worship? Because if any church meeting is marked by selfishness, and by the way, as a side, isn't that what most of the church movements, the modern church movements that what I believe are apostatizing the word of God are all about is selfishness? What you can get out of it about yourself, about your self-esteem, about, about uh, how you can uh, be, uh, make, uh, make more money and, and, uh, and have more, really ultimately have more pride in yourself and walk around with your nose in the air, you know, like you're somebody because, you know, you, that's selfishness. It's not about that at all, is it? And if our attitude really buries, bears the, uh, the, the business of the unsaved, which is what they're all about, maybe we put a little religious tone on it, that won't work, but it's, it's still the attitude of the unsaved. The meeting is soiled. It's ruined. It is not reflecting Christ at all. We cannot encourage. We cannot focus on Christ. We cannot gr grow in Christ. We meet for worse, as Paul says here, and not for better. Meet for worse and not for better. Back in our text in verse 18, Paul says, for in the first place, which is explaining uh, the primary concern that sets the tone of all else, what is the standard, in other words, in the first place of the meeting he says in verse 18, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. If there are divisions, then what is it reflecting? The same attitude as the unsaved, isn't it? Isn't that what the world is made up of? I anywhere you turn, uh, and that's why we have to have law enforcement. That's why they have to be out there uh, trying to make people behave is because there are divisions among people for whatever reason. Somebody's trying to, to take advantage of somebody else. Somebody's trying to take what belongs to someone else. Somebody's trying to whip up on somebody. Because anger and resentment, and jealousy, and wrong thinking exist at every turn. Schisms is the word division here. It means a split. People being grouped into factions, and they have a tendency to do that. When a, when a church or a group, you know, uh, they, they starts fussing and fighting among the members and among the people, and love just is, is not lo no longer present, they tend to cleave to Okay, well, you know, I'll get next to the people over here that think the way I do about so-and-so or somebody or something else. And then this group over here, well, no, he think this about that, and so we're going to get together. And here you have the same thing that is true in the world. The same thing that is true in the world. And so we ask a question here. Is unity in God's church a big deal? Is unity a big deal? Would you turn with me back to the Gospel of John in John chapter 13, which so happens to be the words of Christ just before the cross when the disciples were terribly troubled as Christ was revealing to them he was going to leave and so forth. And, and what does he tell them? Look at verse 34 of chapter 13. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Well, now, wait a minute. Hasn't that been so from the beginning? Yes, it has. Remember the words of Abel when God confronted him about his murder of his brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, you know the answer to that? Yes. 
<laughs> you are your brother's keeper. I'm my brother's keeper too. Didn't Christ teach that? Isn't that really the good Samaritan? And aren't we told repeatedly to love one another? But here is something even a little bit different. It's a higher level of love. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, look, look at, at what he says here. Even as I have loved you. How has Christ loved us? Well, we were, <laughs> we were really, 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 really worthy of his love, weren't we? No. Romans 5 tells us we were enemies of Christ. That someone might die for a good man. Christ died for sinners. And may I get a little bit theological for a minute, but this is particular love. Particular love. Now, there is love of God in general. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. He treats every man with kindness. No one can complain that God is unfair to them. But he has a particular love for his own children that he has, just like you have for your own children, more than the kids up and down the block. At least I hope you do. Look at John chapter 17 and the high priestly prayer of Christ where this is reiterated. Look at 17 and look at verse 20. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's us. Is he praying for every person the same way? No. He's praying for those who are going to believe in every age. He's praying for his elect. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He is praying for his sheep. And he goes on to reiterate that when we get down to verse 20 through 23. Well, verse 21, they, that they may be, all be one. There's unity, right? They may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Does that mean we're all going to become God in one person? No. He's talking about a union of heart. He's talking about a unity of spirit. The same unity that exists among the Godhead. Can you imagine the unity that exists between Christ and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? <laughs> it, it, cannot be it cannot be understood. But he's talking about God's people, and that's why when we get to Revelation 22 and we're around the throne of God in glory, there is a complete unity there. There's no discord there at all. Now, brethren, we, uh, as a church, and every church that names the name of Christ is supposed to be bearing that same sense of unity and especially I think when you come around the height of worship next to glory which is the Lord's table there must and should be unity I have to go to Philippians chapter 2 just we also often go there and it's such an important passage but it says the same thing and we will find that same theme throughout the scriptures. What does it say? Look at chapter 2 and look at, just jump in at verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. There we are. Maintaining the same love. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He is our standard. He is our example. 
He is our Lord, and He is commanding this through the apostles, through His own lips as He was, uh, was with us upon the earth or with God's people on the earth. You know, and when we have any form of division, this is violated. Now, someone's going to say, well, there are, there are reasons for division that may be legitimate based on God's word. Yeah. If I deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, even if I deny the very sovereignty of God, if I deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. <laughs> if I do that, I'm going to leave myself, okay? But you're going to leave too. That's a legitimate division. But what? But most of the time in the church, I, I can recall a situation in 30 plus years ago in my church life as I was on a board that somebody left the church, a whole family left, and I've seen many things since then because of the color we painted the nursery. Now, brother, I don't think that's in Scripture here. But it was a, an emotional thing to people. We need to be careful. We need to be careful that we're thinking biblically. And so what is... What should normally and naturally happen? Would you look at with me at Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. What is it, maybe word it this way, what is it that should bring us together in unity? Should, should it be because I get up here and berate you to be unified, be unified, be unified, be unified, and on top of that be unified? No. That's not going to work. I don't think it is. That's sort of what I see in... Uh, whatever that town is up there near St. Louis, when the people are out fussing and people are just out, so get be unified, be unified, be unified. Well, <laughs> they don't want to be unified. How is it that we can be unified? Well, the scriptures tell us, Ephesians 4, look at verse 11. Here's what God has done, and this is focusing on the church. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. <laughs> How does it happen? Having the mind of Christ. Get our nose in the word. And here's all this wonderful truth that is here. And it brings the focus narrower and narrower and narrower until the focus is on Jesus Christ himself, and we all have the same mind and the same heart. And we're all thinking the same. Now, we may like, some people here may like a red car, and somebody else likes a blue one. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in things that really matter. We have the same mind. And the purpose of the church is to build us up in the faith that I might know him. And in knowing him, there becomes a little bit of heaven on earth as you know him, as we edify one another, as iron sharpens iron, and we all come to the unity of the faith. The unity of the faith. And he goes on to talk about here, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And he goes on, he says, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the, cap the craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. Now, when Satan beguiled Eve, what did he do? Has God said? Eve, in her foolishness and Adam too disregarded what God said and believed the evil one and what is he about is he is he trying to make us unified in Christ 
I mean, that's another whole piece of this puzzle that we need to, and by the way, we're going to be studying that tonight in Randy's study about Satan, but that's a whole other piece of the puzzle. The evil one is out there in craftiness and treachery trying to tear us apart, trying to ruin the testimony of the church, trying to destroy you. What do we need? Oh, the Word of God. That we might have the mind of Christ. And that when all these things come at us, what, what, this confusion and that confusion and this trouble and that trouble and this problem and that problem, that we don't lose perspective. But we have the mind of Christ and the unity of the faith which is absolutely essential because without it we're going to be every one of us me you we're all going to be a mess so what must worship be well it must be love for God and love for one another isn't that what exactly we've talked about many times Christianity is not rules Christianity is not making a list of things to do and a list of things to don't. Christianity is not trying to make the world right. We can't make the world right. Christianity is a personal love relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your brother as yourself. I think it's your neighbor, but particularly your brother, okay? And so when we get back to our passage in verse... 19, here we are, and there's a faction. And Paul says, for there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Now that is a very scary and sobering thing. What is Paul saying here? There is a purpose of God in the fact that factions exist. So he takes even the things that Satan does. He takes the things that even foolish man does in selfishness or pride or confusion. And he even uses that for good because he says those who are approved may become evident among you. Let's look at something very sobering to me. 1 John, please. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 9 to start with. And 1 John is a book of delineation. John, John draws, a long, uh, draws a line, and he puts those who are of God are over here, those who are not of God are over here. And he's not talking about people in the world, he's talking in people that are religious. He's talking about in the church. He's talking about those that have a profession in Christ. Look at what he says. Verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. When we're talking about unity, it is directly associated with love, is it not? Unity is associated directly with love. Look at 1 John 3, verse 9. 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Two big issues there. Obedience from the heart and love from the heart. He says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is, is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then he goes on to talk about Cain and Abel. Look over at chapter 4, verse 20. This theme is throughout the writing of John. Verse four, uh, 
Chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, where we have Paul delineating the difference between the child of God who has the spirit of God and the, and the people of the world. Verse 20, or back up to 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evidence. This is the person that knows not Jesus Christ, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and so forth. Notice all that business in there about disputes and factions and divisions among, he's talking about God's people. But notice in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And really and truly, everything else emanates from that love. The characteristic of God's people is love. And that's why he said joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, kindness. Why? Because the Spirit of God resides within them. And they actually have love for God and love for one another. Now, why is this then a scary defining statement of Paul? Because like everything in the Bible, it is not a cheap or incidental issue when there are problems around the Lord's table, when there are problems around the worship, around the attitudes, around the, the things that are going on within the people of God. So when we come to verse 20 in our passage, he says, therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's a strange statement, isn't it? What does he mean by that? Well, he has to mean that they are not really meeting out of love for God, a desire to commune with God and each other. That was not their motive. And he goes on to describe why. Well, we know it wasn't their motive. Because of their actions, what they were doing with one another in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. What were they doing? They weren't really worshiping God. They were meeting for the reasons Paul will expose here. And we have to ask ourselves the question, when I meet around the Lord's table, this ordinance, it is not just the mechanics, because if I think of the mechanics of the Lord's table, it's really pretty silly. you got a little old teensy cracker that you can hardly taste, right? and a little bit of juice in a cup that's uh, uh, grape juice. You know, it's not exactly like a sumptuous meal. So the mechanics are not the issue. And yet we recognize from this text that this table is very important to God. In fact, we get on down to verse 31. He's going to talk about people dying as a result of not having a right attitude when they come to this sacred table which Jesus Christ himself said do this in remembrance of me until I come and that's why we do it now he says it's not to eat the Lord's Supper and here's why verse 21 for in your eating each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. <laughs> now, they weren't celebrating the Lord's table as we celebrate today. At this time, apparently, there was either one of two things happening. Either they had what they call a love feast, and theologians are argument, make arguments both ways. Either they have a love feast, and then afterwards they have the ceremony as such of the Lord's table where they break the bread and then drank of the cup together as Christ initiated at the time of the Passover. And this is a, the, the, the Lord's table is a continuation or a picture of the Passover where God saved Israel out of the land of Egypt. And this is a picture of how 
Jesus Christ saved us by his blood and his broken body. So it's symbolic. But here they were having a scrumptious meal together, and either as a separate piece later or as part of the, the, of the eating and having this big feast together, which was really what Christ did with the disciples in the upper room, they broke bread and had a portion of that meal, and they broke, or they had the, the wine in which they drank, and it was supposed to be in remembrance of what Christ did, his, his body and his blood. But the attitudes here don't reflect that, do they? Each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. One is hungry, there was no concern for others. In that economy, you had the haves and the have-nots. There was hardly anybody in between. And the haves were despising the have-nots. Ha! Huh, those poor, pathetic people, they don't even smell good. And so here's the food I brought, and I'm going to eat it, and we're going to all get fat on it, but fully on you. And then there were others there that were drinking the wine in excess and actually getting inebriated. And by the way, they did use real wine back then, and this is obviously so. So I hope that doesn't scare anybody that's teetotaling these days. The issue is not the wine. The issue is the abuse of the wine. Another is drunk. We think back of 1 Corinthians 6 where it says, No drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. They're making a mockery of the table. Uh, what's supposed to be a love fest is an unloving fest. What is supposed to be a love fest is debauchery and sin. These are matters of the heart that are manifested by actions. Notice in verse 22, is this perversion a big deal? What? So that, that word, even the way it's phrased, it's like Paul is looking at this in total exasperation. What? Do you not have houses to which to eat and drink? In other words, do you think that this Lord's table is just somehow mechanics for us to come here and and be a glutton, be a hog, be a pig, be a disregard of others, to be a, a dissension, to be a faction, to care less of what anybody else thinks, and to care less what God thinks. Do your, the issue is not the eating, in other words. The issue is not the drinking. The issue is a sacred issue of love to God and love to one another. And you're bringing the world's mentality, the world's ideas of dissension and faction, and the world's ideas of selfishness and abuse, and the world's ideas of me first and to fully on you into the church of the living God and into the most sacred things that pertain to relationship with Jesus Christ and abusing it. In fact, he goes on to say, do you despise the church of God? I don't think anybody there would have said, oh, I despise the church of God. But th th they're not understanding. They're not thinking. And that's what Paul is trying to get us to do is to think. I need to get my own personal heart right with God. Oh, Lord, help me that I won't despise your table, that I won't despise your son. This is sacred. I'm not talking about it being mystical like uh, transubstantiation, where the Catholics think this actually becomes the body of Christ. No, I'm not talking about that. But it is sacred, isn't it? Because we're to do it in remembrance of him. How can I be doing this in remembrance of him if I'm despising God, by my actions and despising others, that I should be loving by my actions and my heart 
And so Paul says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? It's almost like he's speechless here. What shall I say? This is so off the chart. I, I don't, shall I praise you? I can't praise you for this. Do you think just coming together and going through the, the motions of this is something that's praiseworthy? Well, goody, goody for you. You came together and you partook of the Lord's table. And may I say that really reflects on all of worship. God help us that when we come, to worship the true and the living God, and really it should spread through the entire week. It should spread through our lives, and we live our lives in a way that is pleasing to God. But certainly, certainly when we come around his table, there should be a sense of honoring him. Now, in closing, <laughs> look at Colossians chapter 3 with me, and I'll just simply read this. If I back up really to chapter 3, verse 6, it is because of these things the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. We don't want to act like the sons of disobedience. God's going to pour his wrath out on this world. Well, the church should be different, right? He says in verse 8, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth, and do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman. We're not looking around saying, well, you know, I, I don't really like you or you, you know, you, whatever. You don't fit my idea. But what is the real attitude? Christ is all. Boy, that, that statement right there is it. Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, and whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all this, because really it is the issue, beyond all this, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. God help us in all that we do, myself included, to have the mind of Christ. And where I fail you, forgive me. And sometimes you're going to fail me, and I forgive you. Because believe it or not, I really do love you. And I hope you love me. So with that heavy hand, let's uh, go into the Lord's table and celebrate this Lord's table together in unity. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the penetrating word of God we thank you, Father, that you're not like sinful man. You're not like us. And you have said that in the world we have tribulation, but you have overcome the world. So the world is a mess. But we can find our hope. And we can place our love in you and even be unified around you. Help us to honor you in all that we do, we ask in Jesus' name.